And with that, we come to Acts, the 19th chapter, where we left off last week. We had made it uh, through verses 11 and 12 uh, just a little bit. I mentioned just a little bit about 11 and 12, but I need to pick up again on verses 11 and 12 tonight because verses 11 and 12... Uh, both are needed to uh, to finish verses 1 through 10 and they're needed to inter introduce verses 13 through 14. So I, I, they're, they're pivotal verses that go both ways and neither one of the sections would make complete sense, sense without these particular verses. So you remember last time we were studying Apollos as he came in and he got uh, some instruction on a more excellent way from Aquila and Priscilla. And then Paul comes into Ephesus where he's going to be, and we're going to spend the night here in Ephesus, the Bible study in Ephesus, and he meets these 12 men who are members of the way that we looked at last week, and we're going to come and give a little bit more definition to this week. And yet, uh, these are men who had had their uh, baptism under the baptism of John, a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And <clears throat> if... Uh, uh, that, that, that was contrasted. You remember Apollos and these uh, 12 men really went together. They were all walking in the same way. They were believers in Jesus as Messiah, but I gave that somewhat shocking statement last week that belief in Jesus as the Messiah is not enough for salvation. You have to believe that Jesus is the propitiation of our sins. He is the death, burial, and resurrection. He's the satisfaction uh, for our sins, not just the Jewish Messiah. And these were Jews that were all in question here with Apollos and Paul and as he was at Ephesus visiting with these Jews. And they had received the message of John the Baptist, which was a message about the king and the kingdom. And they believed all of this. And they had received John's baptism. And they had repented. And they were waiting for this Jewish king, Jewish king uh, to come. And probably even believing that it was Jesus. And waiting for him to establish the kingdom. But... They did not know anything about grace and the age in which they are living now. And so after Apollos learned about grace, you remember, it says in verse 27 at the end that he greatly helped those who had believed through grace. That's not how Paul, uh, excuse me, how Apollos had believed. Apollos had believed through repentance. He had believed through his baptism. And then he was shown a more excellent way or shown the, more, the way of God more accurately. So uh, then uh, with that, uh, Paul is there. He's teaching and preaching in Ephesus and things are going well. And he stays there for two years in verse 10 so that all who lived in Asia heard the word of the Lord, both the Jews and the Greeks. And then verse 11. God was performing extraordinary miracles by the hands of Paul. How extraordinary were they? Well, as a matter of fact, they were so extraordinary that handkerchiefs and aprons were even carried from his body to the sick, and the diseases left them, and the evil spirits went out. Wouldn't you say that's extraordinary? That the power of God was so much on the Apostle Paul that uh, even his handkerchiefs and his aprons uh, absorbed some of that power in such a way that they were able to take these off of his body and take them to the body of the sick and diseases left them and the evil spirits went out. Don't you wish that still occurred? I would. Uh, how, mu how much would that handkerchief be worth? I mean, you pay a lot of money just for health insurance, don't you? If you had that handkerchief, forget the health insurance. And uh, it would uh, be a lot better than Obamacare or anything that uh, the Republicans can offer on the other side. All we need is that handkerchief, right? Here, I've been struggling from lack of a voice. If I just had Paul's hanky, all would be good. Uh, but I don't have it. And uh, you don't have it. So we suffer from these uh, illnesses and distresses that are ours. Now... I am convinced that these verses 11 and 12, first of all, are, are, are very accurate. He's telling us exactly what was happening, and it's not camouflaged in any way. And so, these were extraordinary miracles, uh, and uh, he comes and says it was really extraordinary. Uh, hankies and aprons were being used to bring healing to the sick and casting out the evil spirits. So, they were extraordinary. Now, what do you do with this today, 2015, if... 
uh, you, you don't believe in dispensational theology. Remember, dispensations is some things happen here, some things happen there, but uh, these things that happen here don't always happen over there. And so how do you separate what happened in verses 11 and 12 from what you and I experience today? How come we're not able to experience these extraordinary miracles like this? And uh, so your, your choice then, if you're not a dispensationalist, your choice is uh, one of several things. First of all, you can say, well, uh, we actually can experience this. The problem is our faith is just not strong enough. And if we had a stronger faith, then we would be able to do this. And so we will, might begin to say, well, what is it that makes this strong faith? Well, you've got to believe. You've got to believe with all your heart. Well, who believes with all their heart? Well, I guess, you know, my grandmother does. She believes with all her heart. Well, can, she, can we take your grandma's hanky then and do this? Well, no, my grandma's hanky doesn't do that. Well, why not? Well, I guess my grandma doesn't believe well enough, you know. Well, maybe, maybe it's Billy Graham, you know. I mean, he's the one that believes with all his heart. He's the one that's got this. So let's take Billy Graham's hanky, right? And his hanky doesn't work either, nor his apron. So we, we run into these problems that whatever this lack of faith is that we're blaming it on must be, exclu uh, excuse me, must be uh, 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 held by every Christian we know. And every Christian we can come up with. Because we don't know anyone whose hanky really works. Now we know some people who are hooksters and try to sell their hanky and uh, pretend like it works. But we also know the reality of that, right? So we uh, search the Christian world and we don't find anyone who has that kind of faith. So I guess then we just say, well, we just live in this age in which there's not very much faith. And uh, yet, I'm not, I, I just don't think that's a very satisfactory answer. Uh, to say, well, we could all have this ability, it's just that none of us do. Uh, or you could come along and say, well, only apostles had this ability. This is what I used to say, by the way, that uh, this was something that was given to apostles. And that sounds pretty good and does pretty good, except uh, every now and then you run across guys like Philip, who's not an apostle. And if you read Acts chapter 8, Philip is doing some pretty extraordinary miracles. And how is he carrying out these miracles? And Philip's not the only one. There are others in the, in the gospel, uh, excuse me, in the book of Acts as well, that are performing these miracles and they themselves are not apostles. So then I kind of broadened it and I said, well, it's for apostles or apostolic emissaries. Uh, that was something that I made up uh, to, to be those that the apostles approved that this could happen for. Or then I said, you know, well, it's the apostolic age. But then, as I mentioned, and I'll mention again here in just a moment, you run across those problems that these miracles seem to cease before the apostolic age were over, or some of the apostles lived beyond the apostolic age, which seems kind of an odd, uh, odd thing. So uh, the, it wasn't that the apostles seemed to have these gifts because they lived beyond Beyond these gifts. So what do you do with it? Uh, you can uh, you can say, well, this was a limited experience. It's just a historical account of what was happening on that day. And you certainly can do that. And honestly, uh, if you're not a dispensationalist, that's probably the best way to go. Uh, you don't have anything to prove it with, but you can't unprove it either. So you just say, you, you would do what I do often, and I'm going to do one time tonight, and say you don't take a historical account and make a doctrine out of it. So that's the best bet you can get here is to say, God chose to do this right then and there in the sovereignty of God. That's the way God works. I don't know why God doesn't make my hanky do that, uh, but he doesn't. And so you could uh, get away uh, with that if you wanted to, is just say this is a, a limited experience. You don't have anything to go on really biblically uh, to say, you know, here's, here, here's where, why this is limited. And the problem is you're going to find it in so many other places. You're going to say it's a historical account here with these people and there with those people and here in these circumstances and over there with those circumstances and there are so many of these that coming together that your argument seems to sound a little weak by the time it's over. There's another thing you can do, and that is you can just deny the truthfulness of Scripture altogether, which is uh, what the Broadman Bible Commentary of 1970 did. And do you know who, prints the broad, who printed the Broadman Bible Commentary? Broadman Press. And do you know who owns Broadman Press? You do. 
<laughs> that is a what then was the Baptist Sunday School Board, and uh, and and now is Lifeway. And uh, here's what the Broadman Bible Commentary in 1970 said: uh, The people did not understand that the power came from God through the apostles. Now I might just say he made that up. There's no indication here that the people did not understand this. Uh, in fact, Luke says, God was performing extraordinary miracles by the hands of Paul. Seems to me it's pretty understandable. But uh, this professor, Smith happens to be his name, happens to have some insight that we did not have, that the other people did not understand. Now going on, it uh, says... This gave rise to certain superstitious practices. The people believed that Paul's apparel had healing power. So they took handkerchiefs and aprons from him and used them to touch those who were sick. Now, let me ask you a question. Why did the people believe that those handkerchiefs and aprons had healing power? Because they had healing power. That's right. I mean, that's very clearly what the scripture says. So uh, the, the Baptist professor uh, at a Baptist college was saying, oh, these people were, this, this was snookering. They, they were, they, this is what they thought. This was superstitious. And they didn't understand, you know, God does a miracle here. And they, 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 they uh, uh, you know, took it and ran with it. Give them an inch and they'll take a mile. And uh, that's what was going on here. The problem is the text is pretty clear that the miracles were extraordinary so that this is what was happening. And this, really what he's done here, I think, is a denial of the Word of God. He's, just, he's, 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 he's trying to get out of this somehow, and so he brings up this superstitious belief. Now, things like this, honestly, uh, someone will look at that and say, uh, yo, he didn't deny the Word of God there, but he did deny the Word of God there. He says, the people didn't recognize it, and this is what they believed. But Luke says, God did this, and this is what God was doing, and this is what the people were doing on, uh, as a response to what God is doing. So, I think we ought to be very careful here. Now, that was in uh, 1970, and of course that was before the conservative resurgence of the, uh, that took place in the Southern Baptist Convention, the one that so many in the 1970s and 80s, remember, said didn't need to happen because we were such a conservative denomination, Right? And uh, go back and read the newspapers and you'll see. Uh, but, uh, you know, it didn't need to happen. We're, we're the most conservative thing there is out there. We believe the Bible, every word of it. Uh, and yet this is the stuff we were printing. And I might add to you that we think we're conservative today, but we're printing stuff just as bad. We uh, undermine the scriptures just over and over. And I happen to think it's time for resurgence 2.0. And uh, bring that uh, back again. And every generation almost has had to go through this in bad his life because we just drift away from uh, that old time religion, so to, so to speak. We drift away from a strong cons uh, conservative fundamentalist uh, 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 belief in verbal plenary inspiration is what happened. And it happens over and over and you can find many, 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 many examples of it if you would like to. Now, I think the best thing to do, as I mentioned last week on these, is to be a dispensationalist and to recognize that there was this, uh, I'll call it a mini dispensation, if you will, and uh, the mini dispensation is, is what I'm calling the age of the kingdom offer. From John the Baptist through uh, the destruction of Jerusalem, you have the kingdom being offered. And all these miracles are taking place. In fact, when you read the Old Testament, there are a few miracles, but not, not like this. There aren't many miracles. It was extraordinary just to have a miracle and uh, demon possession and demons being cast out and all these kind of things. You don't see that much in the Old Testament. Every now and then it happens. But here, as soon as you open, as soon as John comes about, then it's every page there's a miracle and another miracle and another miracle and another miracle and it goes on. And, and then uh, at the, uh, about the time of the destruction of Jerusalem, it totally drops off. You don't see it anymore. And what happens here? I think it's that age of the kingdom offer. I called it a mini dispensation, uh, which uh, technically it's not a dispensation of its own. Uh, just like the tribulation is not a dispensation of its own, but it's a mini dispensation in a sense. It's part of another one, but it's a transitionary dispensation. And that's what I would uh, believe about this one here. Now, uh, with that little bit of intro in verses 11 and 12, we come to verse 13. And it says, also, some of the Jewish exorcists, 
who went from place to place, attempted to name over those who had the evil spirits the name of the Lord Jesus, saying, I adjure you by Jesus whom Paul preaches. Here they come. Let's talk about these Jewish exorcists for a moment. And they are uh, attempting to cast out demons. Do you remember that there was a... Uh, a, a group of people who are casting out demons in Jesus' name in the Gospels, and that the disciples, uh, the apostles wanted to stop it. Uh, Lord, they're casting out demons in your name. We need to stop them. And what did he say? If they're, if they're not against us, they're for us. What he said, let them go. Let them keep working. And here we're going to see a different story. And yet one thing I would ask you to look for as you look uh, through this story is that those in the Gospels were casting out demons. These guys are not casting out demons. They are trying to cast out demons. They're, they're, they're wannabe exorcists, if you will. Now, with that said, uh, these uh, Jewish exorcists, do you know, first of all, that this is the only time in the Bible the word exorcist is used? And yet... There's a whole bunch of times when there are demons cast out, right? So why doesn't the Bible talk about the exorcism of demons? Here's uh, something that I try to do, and I don't always do really well, but uh, I, I've, I try to train myself that when I'm talking about the Bible to speak biblically. Does that make sense? <laughs> when I'm talking about the Bible, use the same kind of words that the Bible will use. Uh, here's an example that uh, may surprise you. But you, uh, you don't hear me talking about uh, the atonement of Christ. And the reason is, the Bible doesn't talk about the atonement of Christ. Now, you can go to any theology book and look up a section about Christ's atonement. And it, it, I, I will even go so far to say, most of those theology books are actually going to be right in what they say in that chapter. They're just using the wrong word. Uh, atonement is an Old Testament word. Atonement is what the lamb and the goat and the, uh, and the ox, it, it atoned. It covered. Jesus did not cover. Jesus satisfied, expiated, propitiated. And so you'll hear me talking about the propitiation of Jesus Christ. Because if you look carefully uh, in the New Testament, this is what it says that Jesus did. Uh, is he propitiated or expiated our sins. He was the total payment for our sins, not a covering for our sins, like the sacrifices of the Old Testament in which you had to come over and over and over. And, and every year you had the day of atonement. Cover it up again, cover it up again, cover it up again, until Jesus came and he uncovered it, took it upon himself, and, uh, and, and satisfied, paid the, paid the penalty in full. Now, I think we ought to be careful on those things, and even though the next time you go out and you read a book or you hear a preacher and they're talking about Christ's atonement, they probably mean the right thing, I would just say, oh, let, 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 let's uh, use a little better word here. You're not quite exactly right in what you're doing. And probably we use atonement because propitiation we don't know how to spell, right? Uh, and it's hard to define, it's hard to explain, everything else. But I'm just convinced when we talk about the Bible, we ought to use Bible, we ought to talk like the Bible. And uh, the Bible talks about propitiation. Now, uh, I think that also we should not be saying that uh, Jesus did the work of exorcism. Or the, uh, the apostles were exorcists. They weren't. They cast out demons. Jesus cast out demons. The apostles cast out demons. Uh, there's some prophets in the Old Testament that cast out demons, but they were not exorcists. An exorcist is just used this time, and these are guys who can't get the demon out. They're going to end up wounded and naked here in just a minute. That's just a preview. And the, they, they, they are powerless here. So, Paul, it already says right there in the, uh, in the previous verse, uh, they left them and evil spirits went out. 
And these guys are watching from the, in, from the outside, and they're saying, I, you know, he said something about the name of Christ there, the name of Jesus, and so they're going to try this formula that goes. And that's really what exorcism has to do with, is a formula. Trying to use a formula in order to, uh, uh, to have power over the forces of darkness. Well, how many of you think that formula is going to work, whatever it is? No, you can't come up with some sort of incantation. And uh, the word here, uh, exorcist, is actually a Greek word. Uh, exorciste is what they are. And it is, uh, it's based upon uh, ex, uh, or, or, let me read it so I get it right. Um, I think I have it there somewhere. Do I? Yeah. Ek. There we go. And, and orcos, horcos, uh, is an oath. Uh, so literally it is out of an oath. So what they're doing is these are people who come working out of an oath. Now, that, uh, that word for oath, uh, we're going to see it in just a minute when these people start talking and they're going to say, I adjure you. In the name of Jesus, I adjure you. And that word adjure is actually this uh, Greek word right here, uh, horkos. So, the ek horistes come and horkos. This is what they do. They try to speak an incantation. Speak an oath. Speak a spell, if you will. And through the, the words of their mouth and the incantation that they bring about, they, they want to accomplish some spiritual task. That's an exorcist. Now, again, it's the only time we see it here. And this is why I would say to you that there is no such thing biblically as a Christian exorcist. You, you, can, you can't be a Christian exorcist. Because uh, you, what, what, what kind of Christian would come along and speak some sort of incantation or spell in order to have power over the spiritual forces of darkness? Shall we get a committee together and see what that uh, incantation is going to be? My, my personal opinion is it should start with abracadabra. <laughs> right? Now, why do you laugh at that? Say, because it's silly. <laughs> And that's what they're doing, is trying to come up with some sort of verbal formula that will carry it out. But I promise you, you can uh, get online uh, easily or on, uh, 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 you know, some uh, book, book store, book, you know, on, on uh, how to have uh, power over the demons in your life or whatever. And they are going to go from, from a, a light degree in which they're just going to say, uh, if it's negative, don't say it. Because... It, th those words will come to life, they'll, they'll come to, to root, they'll come to power, and it'll, be, it, it'll, it'll happen if you say it. You're allowing it to happen. And this is the idea of ek horistis, out of an oath, out, out of a, an incantation or a word that's given. Now, uh, if you go far enough on that end, you'll find that eventually books or Christian teachers who are saying, now these are the words, this is the formula that you've got to give. And, you know, you've got to have a cross and holy water and garlic and, you know, whatever it is. And you have to say these words, uh, preferably in Latin, you know, what, and, and, and you come up with this, this craziness, honestly, is what it is. And it is nothing more than these, these Jewish guys here are trying to do. Uh, and uh, the, the, the Jews and exorcism... Uh, there's a little bit of a, a history here in that uh, Solomon, you remember, King David's son and uh, the king himself, uh, is said by Josephus, this is not in the Bible, but he's said by Josephus to have been given the powers of uh, exorcism and that he was given a formula for exorcism. And I, I gave you the reference there. You can Google it and find, uh, find it in the Antiquities of the Jews by Josephus, and I gave the chapter and verse. Uh, and it's really rather interesting. It has to do with a certain root, uh, that you had to get this root from the ground, uh, and uh, you had to put a ring in the nose and stick this root through the ring. This was the Jewish teaching that uh, had been carried down, and Josephus was saying, hey, this is what Solomon did. I don't know if Solomon did. Solomon did that or not, honestly. I know that that's what Josephus said Solomon did. And 
And uh, there had grown up then a, a little industry, if you will, in Judaism of Jewish exorcists doing these sort of odd abracadabra kind of formulas in order to have power over these spiritual forces of darkness. And uh, here... These come in in order to cast out these demons. Uh, so these, coming back to our passage of scripture then in verse, uh, chapter 19, verse uh, 13 says these Jewish exorcists went from place to place. That honestly is sort of a, clean, cleans up their reputation a little bit, uh, that translation. Uh, what it, uh, the, the word is, uh, is wandering. They were just wandering exorcists. Now you don't, you don't think quite as highly of a wandering exorcist as you do an itinerant exorcist, right? I mean, it's, it, uh, the, the, the way we sort of clean it up, these are exorcists that go from place to place. They carry out their ministry here, and then they go and carry it out here. But it's just, they were wandering. And, and, and I, I, I think the King James got it best here when it just says, vagabond exorcists. Now, do you give them any respect at all when, you, when they're vagabond exorcists? And yet, that's the, the, the thrust of the uh, terminology that is used. And uh, here they are, these Jewish vagabond exorcists. And they attempted, again in verse 13, to, uh, to, to name over those who had evil spirits the name of the Lord Jesus. You've, um, you've heard it taught, haven't you? If you ever want to cast out a demon, you know, pronounce the name of Jesus. And there's a lot of people out there uh, binding Satan, using the name of Jesus, and they're building it off this passage right here, and yet it didn't work for these guys, right? Uh, and uh, I preached a number of months ago on uh, demonism and exorcism. You can go back and uh, find the teaching on that if you want a little more in this. But these vagabonds are teaching to, uh, are, are attempting to do this. And uh, the, the, uh, the word here, attempting, uh, literally means they took into their own hands. So they'd seen Paul do it. They probably had read about Solomon do it. And they decided to take it into their own hands. It's a dangerous proposition, isn't it? And sometimes, especially in uh, student ministries or young adult ministries, college ministries, uh, we get so fascinated with the spiritual forces of darkness that we decide, hey, we're going to take this into our own hands and we're going to uh, have control over demonic powers. And I think the warning here is you might end up wounded and naked. Uh, it doesn't turn out good. This is not something that we want to attempt to take into our own hands. And so continuing on then, uh, they, they uh, speak the name of the Lord Jesus saying again, I adjure, there's that word, I adjure you by Jesus whom Paul preaches. Worked for him, we're going to try it for us. And then there's some specifics here. Verse 14, seven sons of one Sceva, a Jewish chief priest, were doing this. We don't know anything about Sceva other than what's told right here. Uh, there's no record of uh, Sceva in any of the uh, Jewish documents. So what kind of a chief priest he, he, he was, we're, we're not exactly sure. But uh, he was a, uh, uh, probably of the priestly tribe and uh, put himself in some sort of ruler position. And here they, these seven sons were doing this. Verse 15, And the evil spirit answered and said to them, I recognize Jesus, and I know about Paul, but who are you? Quite the insult, isn't it? And uh, also just a tad humorous. Uh, I, I recognize Jesus. I know about Paul. Who are you? And uh, that had to have been, a, a, again, just a, uh, uh, a slap in the face, if you, if you will, a little bit uh, an insult to these seven sons of Sceva, you know, the uh, Jewish vagabond exorcists who are uh, son of the chief priests. And... Uh, they're not known by the spiritual world. Now, I, let, let's talk about those words. I recognize Jesus. I know about Paul. I think that uh, actually these words are poorly translated in the New American Standard. And also, I would even say in the King James here. In fact, it's an example of how if you really want to study scripture well, uh, do it in the original languages. 
And all of you are saying, I don't have the, I don't know the original languages, and I could never learn them. Uh, but you can get a Strong's Concordance, right? And so you don't really have to know the original languages because with a Strong's Concordance or a simple computer interlinear, you can look at it and you can see that the word uh, recognize for Jesus and the word know for Paul are two different words. Now, first of all, I'd commend New American Standard for actually using two different words in the translation. This is what the problem I have with the King James is they just said, I know Jesus and I know Paul. You would think it was the same word, but it's not the same word. So, uh, uh, New American Standard says, I recognize. I think, I, I think, if anything, they should have swapped these. Should have said, I know Jesus and I recognize Paul. Uh, but uh, to, to recognize doesn't sound like you've got a whole lot of intimate knowledge, right? Yeah, I, I recognize him. Uh, but the word here is that word gnosko. And it is the word that is an experiential knowledge. In fact, if you know Spanish, that you perked up your ears a little bit because you know conocer or conozco is I know. Uh, not, not I have some mental knowledge, but I know this, this person. I have a familiarity. He and I are friends. Uh, and, you know, I can, I can give you his phone number. I can go to his house, those kind of things. That's, that's the, the manner in which I know. And this is the word that is used here that that uh, Spanish word is built upon. And so he says, that th these demons say, I've got some experience with Jesus. I know him. And uh, it, it makes you wonder, and of course we have no way of knowing, but it makes you wonder if uh, one of these hadn't met Jesus before, maybe in Galilee. Uh, you know, maybe they came out of pigs or something. And uh, is it, oh, yeah, this Jesus, I know him. <laughs> Trust me, I know him. And then he, he says, uh, uh, I, I, I e epistemi is the word. I epistemi. Paul. Now, if, you're, if you know your $2 words in English, you know that epistemology is the study of knowledge. And uh, if you know your Greek, you would know that epistemi is epi, which is upon, and histemi, which is a stand. So, upon a stand. Now, that is to say, that uh, we, we would say it almost a little opposite, but we would mean the same thing. In, in, instead of saying, I am upon a stand, we would say, I understand. And uh, this is what e e epistemi mean is, I understand. Now, there are a bunch of times in the New Testament when epistemi is translated no, K-N-O-W. But if you look at every one of those, and you could substitute the word understand, and it would work. So, here it, it comes, and, and uh, epistemi is the word for, I understand Greek, I understand algebra, I understand the weather, I understand, uh, uh, you know, all these things. Uh, it's, a, it's a knowledge kind of word, just like it is, epistemology is in, in English. So, uh, he's saying, I have had some experience with Jesus, and I understand Paul. I, I comprehend what he's up to. But who are you? You and your silly incantations. <laughs> yeah, you, this does not scare me. I don't even know uh, who made this up. Where did this come from? And the demons themselves are, are uh, if you will, making fun of and humiliating uh, these seven sons of Sceva as it uh, goes along. And uh, this, uh, who are you also, I think says a little bit, as I put on the outline, that uh, the demons, sort of like, uh, like Paul, uh, excuse me, like God, are no respecter of persons. I don't care if you're the sons of Sceva, the chief priests. I, I don't get you. Uh, who are you? And they, uh, they just uh, go, go at it. And, uh, you know, if, if we think by our spirituality, by our incantations, by whatever it is that we've got, our lineage, that we can impress the demons, I think we're fooling ourselves, right? 
And uh, here these guys thought they'd have the demons shaking in their boots. Verse 15, and the evil spirits answered and said, I recognize Jesus, I know about Paul, but who are you? And the man in whom was the evil spirit leaped on them and subdued all of them and overpowered them so that they fled out of that house naked and wounded. Notice the demons didn't come out. The, the demons worked through the man. And uh, the, the, the poor man left there uh, still demon-possessed, but uh, these seven sons of Sceva uh, run home humiliated. Verse 17. What to make a movie, right? <laughs> this became known to all, both Jews and Greeks, I'm sure it did, who lived in Ephesus, and fear fell upon them all in the name of the Lord, and the name of the Lord Jesus was magnified. Verse 18, many of those who had believed kept coming, confessing and disclosing their practices. And many of those who practiced magic brought their books together and began burning them in the sight of everyone, and they counted up the price and found it 50,000 pieces of silver. So the word of the Lord was growing mightily and was prevailing. Now, uh, back uh, there to verse 18. Many of those who had believed. Now, these are, uh, as, you, as you trace it back, you remember that there were a lot of people already in Ephesus who had believed, right? And these are the kinds of believers that uh, believed in the grace of Jesus Christ. They were saved. These were Christians. These were uh, part of those who had experienced some of these extraordinary miracles. They had been taught by uh, Paul uh, and not, not uh, following the baptism just of John, but they'd been given more excellent way. They knew everything they needed to know. They were uh, a part of the body of Christ just like you and I are part of the body of Christ. So here are believers and they kept coming, uh, confessing and disclosing their practices. What they were doing is repenting, right? These are believers who are repenting. And I would say to you, that's where repentance belongs. When you become a believer, then you repent. And uh, for someone who preaches the gospel of grace, as I do, I'm often asked, as I, I was even today, by the way, uh, you know, well, how come you don't teach repentance? Well, wh what about repentance? I teach repentance. I teach it where it belongs. And uh, it, it belongs as a response to the salvation, the grace that God gives to us. And so we come to Jesus. We realize that he has, he, he has become the propitiation of our sins. He is, the sa he is our Savior. He has offered us salvation so much so that the scripture not me but the scripture says God is not counting their trespasses against them so how can I turn around and say but you need to repent of them even though he's not counted against them it'd make me feel better uh, so in salvation God is not counting your trespasses against you he is offering this free gift come and get it whosoever will may come and I think that's grace, and that's amazing grace, and marvelous grace, like we sang about Sunday, that we've got to preach. Uh, so, there's no place for repentance? Sure there is. You see it all through the works of Paul. And that is, believers should repent. They, they come to a place where they realize, uh, for us, uh, through the pages of Scripture, for these people, through the work of God, uh, look, th this is what God is up to. This is the character of God, the mind of God. And yet, look in my life. I'm still caring about some of these things. And so, here were some of these believers, and they were confessing, repenting, disclosing their practices, and they brought their magic books. Believers with magic books. Now, notice... Magic books. What do you think of magic books? It's, 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 it's exorcism. Yeah, it's full of uh, silly incantations, you know. And now, why did they have magic books? This is not the kind you get at the booth in the mall, by the way, that teaches you some sleight of hand. The, the, this is people who, in the city of Ephesus, and there's some history behind this. You can go and read. I won't uh, share it with you. But in the city of Ephesus, this, uh, uh, this thing of incantations and working spells and casting spells and all that kind of stuff, it was a big deal. And so a lot of them came out of this world. And they still had, whether they were using it just on occasion or, or, or you know, still on the shelf, no, Nonetheless, they had their book of incantations, and they were uh, they 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 looked at this and they said, you know what? 
Uh, we've just seen something, seen a work of God that shows us that these magic books not only are powerless, but they're also offensive. Uh, offensive to God. And so we want to get rid of them. And so they repented of this. They brought their books and they began burning them in the sight of everyone. And look at that, 50,000 pieces of silver. I don't know if it was a big piece of silver or a small piece of silver. But I know if you got 50,000 of them, that's a lot of money, isn't it? And, uh, uh, you know, a Judas might have come along and said, we could have sold it and given the money to the poor, right? And yet they didn't. I mean, it was up in smoke, literally. It was gone. There's nothing you can do about it after those books are burned. And uh, uh, I'm sure that these people had the discussion, you know, if we could sell it, use the money for some good purpose. But then they say, well, yeah, but we're going to sell it to someone else who's going to use it. And then in a sense, their blood's going to be on my hands. So how in the world can I sell it to them? And so they uh, did what was the right thing to do, and that was they burned him. Now it says in verse 20, So the word of the Lord was growing mightily and prevailing. Now the word so there is right. Uh, it's correct. In fact, you could, though it's not the Greek word, you could almost put in the word therefore. Because the word so here does have that much uh, impact on the sentence. As a result of this, of what was taking place, the word of the Lord was growing mightily and prevailing. Now, here's what I promised you I was going to say earlier. I do think that we have to be careful not to make a historical account into a, a, a doctrine or a teaching or a guarantee. And if all of you come together and burn your magic books... We can gather together out in the back and have a, a little fire if you'd like. Uh, but if you come and burn your magic books, I don't know if, a, if the word of the Lord is going to work mightily and prevail. I don't know if there'll be a revival. I, 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 it, there, there might be a revival if we repent of those things and put it all in. Or... Uh, we, we live in a different world. The world might uh, drive by and saying, they are crazy. That was 50,000 pieces of silver they just burned up. And I'm not joining a bunch of kooks like that. I don't know what the world's response would be. And this is an account of what happened that day. Uh, if I'm going to build some kind of a doctrine uh, off of it, then I better find some place where I can uh, get a, actually a teaching in the scripture. Say, here's what you should do. So, uh, uh, repentance. Should we repent of things that are pagan? You can find, <coughs> excuse me again, <coughs> you can find actual teaching passages that tell you to do that. Now, should you always burn uh, your, your, your bad books or uh, you know, those old 8-track tapes you had of ACDC or Led Zeppelin or who was it, Vic? It, Aerosmith, thank you. <laughs> I just, I, I could tell in you that, uh, you know, there was some of that 70s rock and roll sitting on the 8-track on the cassette uh, table, right? Uh, <laughs> so we, uh, you know, what, what, do, do we need to come and burn it? Oh, I don't know that you need to come burn it. Uh, but the things that are displeasing to God, certainly we want to get rid of in our lives. And we pray that the word of God would grow mightily and prevail. But to, to say, if you burn your magic books, the word of God will grow mightily and prevail, you're, you're just um, creating another incantation, aren't you? You're creating another formula. And we'd love for that formula to work, but that formula is not given to us there in the scripture. So, uh, as we uh, carry on in verse 21, it says, Now after these things were finished, Paul purposed in the spirit to go to Jerusalem. After he had passed through Macedonia and Achaia, saying, after I've been there, I must see Rome also. And he sent to Macedonia two of those who ministered to him, Timothy and Erastus, and he himself stayed in uh, Asia for a while. About that time, there occurred no small disturbance concerning the way. Let's uh, stop and uh, talk about that for just a moment. And uh, Jim Murphy I see you near the water. Would you bring me a drink? Uh, so, uh, no small disturbance concerning the way. What is the way? We saw it 
last week in chapter 19, we've seen it in chapter 8, I believe it is, we're going to see it some more. And uh, most often when you look at it, it is, uh, the, the, the teaching is, well, that's, that's the church. It was, before it was called the church, it was called the way. And uh, yet, I am convinced that there, there's not that many times, there's probably four or five times you look at it, but those four or five times you look at it, I'm convinced that the way is actually that Jewish sect of, uh, thank you, Now back to the sermon. It is that Jewish sect of, uh, of those who believed that Jesus was the Messiah. That is to say, Apollos would have been considered to be part of the way. And it's always used in a very Jewish context, and there are a number of occasions, in fact, when we get there uh, in, I believe it's Acts chapter 24, we will see that there are... Uh, there are some times when it just doesn't work to say it's Christian believers. But rather, I think it is these Jewish believers that Jesus is the Messiah, but they might still be in the synagogue. Some of them might be believers like we are. Some of them are, uh, are, are not. They're like Apollos was, believing that uh, he was the Messiah, and they haven't uh, learned the more excellent uh, way yet. And so they are a part, uh, again, of the way. And uh, so there was no small disturbance concerning the way. For a man named Demetrius, a silversmith, who made silver shrines of Artemis. Your King James says Diana, same god, goddess. Um, was, uh, was bringing no little business to the craftsmen. And he gathered together in the workplace of similar trades and said... Men, you know that our prosperity depends on this business. Guess who the real God is? <laughs> We're losing money. We got to do something here. Verse 26, you see and hear that not only in Ephesus, but also all of Asia, this Paul has persuaded and turned away a considerable number of people saying that gods made with hands are no gods at all. Now, there's something uh, I think that's very uh, powerful there. One is that Paul was quite, quite uh, successful, wasn't he? And he was successful at doing what he tried to do, and that is his goal. We've seen it so many times already. When Paul went out, his goal was to what? Persuade. He wanted to change the way they think. And I've told you before, that's my agenda as a pastor too. Change the way you think. And I want you to think biblically. And uh, sometimes that takes a long time. Uh, but you just keep putting it out there and keep putting it out there, keep putting it out there. And eventually you say, oh, you know, I, I, you begin to think different. And Paul was, uh, was quite successful at this. And then it says, he, he turns away a considerable number of people saying, this is Paul saying, gods made with hands are no gods. Gods made with hands are no gods. Don't you know how offensive that is? If you worship one of those gods made with hands? And to, to, for Paul to come in to that culture? I mean, who are you? Why don't you just go back to Jerusalem where you came from, right? And to go into that, that uh, culture that uh, was the center in Ephesus, the center for uh, uh, Diana worship or Artemis, uh, and uh, had this great temple there. The temple, which uh, we won't get to tonight, was actually one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. This is a fabulous place. And here in the shadow of the seven wonders of the world, one of the seven wonders of the world, this great temple to Artemis, you're saying God's made with hands like Artemis is no God at all. And I think that uh, if we're ever really going to be effective in sharing our faith, especially with those of, uh, of other gods, we're going to have to be a little more blunt. And I'm, I'm afraid we've done too much accommodation here. And there's a great debate in uh, even missiology today about, uh, you know, do you call God Allah and Jesus uh, Isa? And do you use their, their names for it? And I, I'm just convinced that you can't do that because the, the, their Allah and our God are two different things. It's just not the same. And so to use their name for Allah 
uh, it, it, it doesn't work. We have to come and, and call ours something different. Uh, I, you know, if you want to use the English word God or the Spanish word Dios or whatever you use, you just can't use Allah because they have a definition of Allah. And, and, and Allah is no God. So you, 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 can't, you can't put these together. And, and Paul comes here, and for those of Artemis, I don't suppose they took it any more friendly. In fact, I know here they didn't take it any more friendly than anyone else would. You're kind of offended at this. And yet there is uh, an offense to the truth sometimes, isn't there? And Paul comes here with this offense. Verse 27, it says, now, uh, this, this is uh, Demetrius again speaking, now on, not only is there uh, danger that this trade of ours falls into disrepute, but also that the temple of the great goddess Artemis be regarded as worthless, and that she whom all of Asia and uh, the world worship will even be dethroned from her magnificence. He's uh, pretty smart here. I don't think he really cares about the second part, but he is good at the rhetoric. Uh, I think he cares about the first part is, we're not going to make any money. And that's the main reason I called you here. Uh, but, you know, for the sake of goddess, let's do this right. Let's, let's uh, uh, get rid of this Paul fella. And so verse 28, and then we'll quit. When they heard this, they were filled with rage and began crying out saying, great is Artemis of the Ephesians or great is Diana of the Ephesians. And with that, we're out of time, but next week we're going to pick up right there and I'll give you a little history of Diana and Artemis and this uh, uh, false uh, religion that was going on here and this disturbance that is going on in Ephesus and show you how uh, there was uh, one government official who handled this honestly pretty well. He was not a believer, uh, but uh, he handled this in a way that is uh, good for businessmen, it's good for pagans, it's good for Diana worshipers, it's good for Christians. It's just a good human principle of how do you deal with a problem like this? And we will look at that next week. And with that, let me lead us in a word of prayer.